Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Jirka Marosek with AOPA. Uh, we are, uh, I'm here in my fortified basement, and uh, we're here to follow up on a conversation with Mark Baker about a month ago or so, right, Mark? Uh, we, the environment was different. Uh, the weather was uh, definitely nicer, and I was not in my basement, uh, and quite a bit has changed since. So um, I think we have some uh, questions and comments from a lot of pilots that we gathered over the last couple of days, some that will be coming in uh, probably live. Uh, thank you those that are watching live right now and those that are going to be watching it in the coming days as well. Uh, so how are you doing, Mark? I'm doing good. I'm here hunkered down in the, my hangar here in Florida with my Super Cubs. So things are not that bad for me. And, and while I'm concerned about a lot of people in this country, and I know a lot of you and the, our members are, uh, I, I believe we're going to get through this thing and we, you know, this too shall pass. But uh, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about as it reflects every, uh, in general aviation. And uh, a lot of interesting things going on, for sure. No kidding. And uh, yeah. <laughs> you and I chatted offline about this, too, and uh, with a lot of the team here. I personally have been incredibly amazed how uh, the crew here at AOPA didn't skip a beat. We had to move a lot of them into you know, basements like mine and their home offices so they can uh, have pilots back, pick up the phone, help them with legal questions. Um, work on the Hill or the FAA on a lot of the issues that this last month has raised. And every one of the crew is, uh, I, I am just amazed. Uh, are you, uh, I'm sure you agree. I, I couldn't be more proud of the uh, team AOPI. Uh, they've been providing the services to our members, you know, getting the magazines out, uh, working on the Hill, you know, driving the high school program, the foundations is working hard to raise the money to do that. Everybody is doing lots of great work remotely and staying uh, in close contact with our members first and then with each other to make sure we can keep this uh, mission for AOPA alive and doing well. So thanks my, to my team at AOPA. Hey, try to make you proud, <laughs> every, every one of us. Uh, so let's get to uh, the long list of questions that we got for you. Uh, some really interesting ones, but let's, you know, the, the, the elephant is in the room. So let's knock out the ones that everybody cares about right now. And uh, I think we got hundreds of rephrased of the same question and that's uh, in what's aopa doing and what's happening with a lot of the the, the renewals right the uh, hey uh, something is expiring i need my annual i need my uh, i need to get checked out and all of these dates are coming as fast as they always were and doors are closed all over the country so uh, what what are we doing about that what uh, what's going to happen so i'll tell you what you know there's one of the efforts that uh, the the DC team and I and others have all been involved in working with the FAA, the regulator side, and then even with Congress to have some of the senators and congressmen that really support the GA caucus step up and send letters to the FAA saying we need extensions. And there's, a, as you might have guessed, there's a long list of items that we need extensions for. As you mentioned, a few BFRs, annuals on aircraft, uh, medicals, the list goes on. And in a, as I heard earlier today, we believe that the SF AR special uh, rule will be out hopefully in the next week or so. We believe uh, at this point in time that everything that makes sense will have extensions to it uh, because it is not um, something that the FAA can talk publicly about. We don't know exactly what's in there. We remain in close contact with them and have asked and requested everything we can think of and work with the rest of the industry to push everything out that makes sense to reasonable dates. And I think we'll see that response in the next week or two. But Unfortunately, we've, uh, we've, we've been disappointed about how long this has taken. Uh, there's a lot of aviators and insurance companies that are asking us to get that date uh, out there so we can remain safe, we can remain in compliance, and to do the things that all of us as aviators want to do, which is do the right thing. But there are lots of public benefit flying going on, moving masks around the country you know, from Ohio to Massachusetts, and, and we want to keep those things going and we want to keep people safe. And we want to be compliant with uh, rules and regulations. So I believe we're going to see something. I believe they've listened to us uh, in the regard, and I know they've listened to Senator Inhofe and, and Congressman Graves and Congressman Bessie uh, to say we've got to find a way to respond to AOPA's request. So stand by. I wish I had better news that was done today, but I think it'll be very soon, and I do believe it'll be uh, what we're looking for. And a big part of it is just keeping airports open, right? I think we've run into it some occasions where we needed to make sure that airports stay open for the missions that you just mentioned, right? I just talked to one of our pilots a couple of days ago that was flying um, to pick up samples that are totally critical for testing right now. But even for that, you know, you need airports open. 
Uh, and we spent right. a lot of time working on that as well, right? We have. You know, there's been a lot of misinformation out there and, you know, some overly concerned, if you will, and um, regarding the idea that they could close the airport on a local basis. Actually, if they're um, indebted to the FAA, which about 3,000 of these airports are, um, they have to have the FAA to, to close them. And the FAA has not closed any airport. We had about a, a dozen that had different issues at different times, and, and the ASNs and the regionals and Mike Ginter and Jim Kuhn and the team have been able to talk everybody back into a reasonable position. I don't believe we have any significant airports closed today anywhere in this country of the 3,000 that are uh, federally entitled as well as the other, other 2,000 that we use as public access points. So uh, general aviation is going on in a good way, and, and a good examples at Loster Camp moved uh, his 172 from Ohio to Massachusetts with some face masks and, and some protective devices. So we can prove and, and provide value to this uh, public today. But I'm also concerned, by the way, I don't mind making this comment. It's not a time for us to be flaunting general aviation in a way that's not a, about doing safe things and making sure if I could ask our members to remind people, uh, people are suffering in a lot of places in the country today. General aviation is a wonderful thing. We're back in full swing and not too distant future, I hope. But we want to be responsible. I believe that uh, what I saw today out of Colorado, uh, the, their Department of Aeronautics recognized that safety of flight is important. Going out and renting right. aircraft to train and do things like that was a, was a clarification. We're asking for those clarifications around the country because we want people to stay current, stay safe, and use these aircraft for public benefit flying. You're absolutely right. You know, I, I personally have the same concern, right? I want to make sure I don't get too rusty once things, and we will get over this and get through this sooner than later, hopefully. Um, we want to make sure that people start flying again sooner than later, keep proficient, uh, as uh, Richard from our safety crew likes to say, you know, the safest airplane is the one you're proficient in, and we need to make sure we're proficient. Uh, in that direction, we do get a lot of those questions around, you know, when can I fly? Can I go flying? When can I start flight training again? Um, what should we, uh, besides the fact that uh, at, um, AOPA's Pilot Information Center website uh, on AOPA.org, uh, pilots can get some answers specific to their state, uh, at least as the answers become clear or change, which is nature of the beast, I think, for the next couple of weeks at the least. Um, what, what can we tell all the pilots out there that either want to get going, have that question, when can, get, when, when can they start again? Yeah, it is very different by state, and it's our understanding the best way to do that is go to AOPA.org and look at what your state is saying about it. Most states are recognizing uh, that flight training for proficiency, for safety, is still an important thing. Commercial flight training, uh, where you don't know the student and the instructors are constantly changing, has largely shut down around the country. Um, somewhere in the 70 or 80 percent, I think was the last poll right. I saw, from uh, commercial flight training. But uh, proficiency training can continue. We recommend that it does. Um, and that if you are also working with a family member in flight training, obviously that can continue. So I think we're, we're trying to make sure that we have the nuances by state up there. And where we find things that have gotten complicated, we try and go get those things corrected by each individual state or city or municipality. But it is probably uh, you know, not going to be a full swing flight training session for a lot of the bigger schools for a while. I mean, I would think at least another four or five weeks. We did a recent uh, seminar about how these flight schools can apply for the small business loans and also the, uh, you know, the payroll protection program, because we want these flight schools to stay in business and, and be ready to go. There is going to be, again, it does seem like it won't happen for a while, but there will be a pilot opportunity, careers, and of course, I also believe that general aviation is going to get a, potentially a boost out of this from, uh, you know, people flying directly to their plants and their businesses with general aviation aircraft in the, in the coming future. Um, because some of these airline routes may not even exist for a while, and you have to get to, to your, either your customers or your factories. So I expect General Aviation really has an opportunity to pick up in the coming future. I mean, the, the numbers for how many more pilots we needed over the next decade were so staggering that regardless of what's happening today, and as tragic as it may be and as disruptive it may be, once we're over this, we, we still need a big pipeline of flight schools making new pilots, right? I certainly believe that, you know, the, you know, in this country, hundreds of thousands of new pilots were needed. Age 65 still remains a, uh, a final date for commercial flight for the airline world. And, and I think that will stay in place. And that, that means that there's going to be opportunities for young people in aviation like never before. It is a pause, certainly. And I don't know if it's going to be a year or four years, but it will come back. It's my full belief. And the opportunities will exist 
and the time it takes to get trained and up to speed. And, and there may be some opportunities in charter flying or business flying that uh, evolve out of this thing as well. Yeah. Uh, we got an interesting question, uh, as, and I, I guess it applies to both, both training or just going out flying. Um, and I, I am frankly not too aware of the states that prohibit driving almost completely, but states where it's almost hard to go out for a drive. You know, here in Maryland, uh, we were pretty well locked down. But if you want to go for a drive by yourself, go out, go for go for a run, you can. Uh, some states uh, supposedly restrict even, or it's even uh, a little iffy to go for a drive to the airport by yourself to go flying by yourself. Have you heard much about that? I've heard about it. I, I, I found generally, if we get the opportunity to talk to each one of the states and talk about the safety of flight, continuing that, and the public benefit side, that most of the state uh, aviation directors, governors, you know, those people responsible for those localities find that, you know, driving to the airport is considered essential to going for a flight of safety, staying current, checking on your aircraft, all those kind of things. Um, it has been recognized, you know, as airports have been recognized as essential. Right. Now, now, with uh, airport services, uh, getting your annual or just getting the airplane checked over after not flying for a month or month and a half, uh, we're clearly creating a little bit of a backlog of service work, right? Uh, if we, we're uh, loosened up and the restrictions are loosened up in the next couple of weeks or a month, whatever it is, we will have a backlog of servicing. Uh, is there a way FA is addressing this? Uh, you know, if, if my annual is due, it's due. And now suddenly everybody else that had April annuals do have them have to get them done in May. Yeah, I, I, that has been part of the request to the FAA and, and hopefully with this SFAR, which we expect the DOT will have sometime early next week and get approved. Uh, all those conditions are uh, being anticipated to have some extension dates. Uh, and I expect that that will be the case, uh, not just a non-enforcement action, but in fact, a real extension is what we've asked for. Um, and I think that that will be the case. Now, again, you know, if your airplane's been sitting outside and it's been raining in, your, in the market you're in, and you need to really take a special time and walk around that airplane and drain the fuel and look, make sure no birds have arrived and built their nests on it, because uh, this is the time of year all that occurs. So, you, you know, the pilot in command is always still first responsible for safety and take a little extra time when you start that pre-flight. Yeah, this is not the time to make those YouTube videos or the, you know, snake coming out of the... Uh... The wing or things like that, right? <laughs> that's, right. <laughs> that's that's very true. Very true. Now, um, kind of on the same line here of the impact of all of this, um, you know, what about buying and selling aircraft? Uh, right now, uh, and I, I keep pretty close contact with a lot of our industry as the nature of my job on your team, uh, and it's and it's interesting. It's spotty uh, in some places. Thing, things are still moving. A lot of airplanes are selling. Parts are selling, things like that. In other areas, it's getting quieter. What do you think it's going to do to just transactions and values of airplanes after this? Well, it's interesting, Yurk. I think you're right. As you know, I've asked you and our finance group to work on some special financing for new aircraft. We're working with manufacturers to try and promote potentially some 0% financing for a couple of years to try and get the industry jump-started. And I think we've had some nice response early on on that. Uh, and yet I believe that, you know, we live in the world of small numbers and new airplanes in general aviation, you know, 1,000 or 1,200 airplanes a year, relatively small number. Could we make it 1,500? I think the answer is yes. Uh, once we get outside of this, you know, kind of lockdown phase, and I do believe people are going to need to travel. They're probably not going to go on a cruise ship. They're probably not going to, in many cases, even have that flight between those two paired cities in the same kinds of frequencies they've had in the past. So, uh, it, assuming there is a need to travel, general aviation, business aviation is going to have an opportunity to step up. So I believe that actually aircraft values can still be pretty good. I mean, for instance, however, maybe a, a Cherokee or 172 may be slightly depressed for a little while um, because of the uh, need or the slowing of flight training maybe for a short term. Um, there's certainly some of the tour planes that are in Alaska and others that people get off cruise ships are going to be probably challenged. But the day-to-day -day general aviation transport kind of go somewhere airplane mm -hmm. i think has upside yeah. and, and, our, and, and, and the financing stands by <laughs> right we, can uh, finance and, those. Uh, we, we have seen uh, actually a, almost a, not a, a shortage is probably the wrong word but uh, the inventory out there of airplanes for sale has has been pretty low and i know our finance team works uh magic with making sure that pilots are able to buy the airplanes or buy the equipment they can, right? Be it re refitting their avionics to buying a brand new airplane or buying it, you know, first time 150 and everything in between. 
but uh, the fact that we have seen up until this point a pretty dry season and just having available aircraft for sale, that might help maintain values, I'm thinking. What do you think? I think it's right. I mean, if you have a good uh, 182 Bonanza, Cherokee, Mooney, uh, on and on and on, a good airplane with good avionics, it is sellable merchandise. And there's somebody out there that's looking for that, I can guarantee you right now. Um, so there is this opportunity, and then there's, a, there's not that much inventory uh, from what we've seen for sale. Uh, so I think, I think it's going to be uh, an interesting summer, but I believe it's going to be positive. Oh yeah, I, I, I would share your optimism, <laughs> and I think I think it will. We'll, we'll make it out. Now, uh, the question around airplanes kind of ties back to FAA in other ways, and that's uh, what's going to happen to the next generation of airplanes or airplanes that are being made and developed right now. Uh, there was a lot on the docket when it comes to uh, the legislation and the rules around. I know LSA, LSA is potentially getting adjustment in weight. There was a lot of rumors around that. Uh, electric aircraft, you know, there's tons of stuff, uh, really, really cool stuff that was happening. Uh, and between the events before uh, the pandemic and now pandemic on top of it, um, what, what's the impact on making sure that some of this stuff still happens? Because it's only good for aviation if all that stuff was in place. I'm still a big uh, believer that uh, the electric aircraft for training is, gonna, is around the corner and the value propositions really seems to be pretty strong. And they continue to march down the path again at certified. Uh, I think that's going to be a real positive uh, when it gets introduced and, and takes some cost out of training of significance. Um, the mosaic rule, which was kind of moving down the path through the FA over the last couple of years and expanding what, what different type rules might look like for expanding the LSA or weight or, you know, maintenance protocols on some older airplanes, other things that we're kind of moving in a very positive direction. Uh, with the team at the FAA and, and uh, has gotten sidetracked significantly uh, with a lot of the Boeing uh, issues and energy going around fixing some of that stuff. And then now, most recently, the uh, COVID-19 distraction of significance. Uh, I, I'd hate to say when that's going to get back on track, but it, it, we believe it's going to move in the right direction. It's just they don't have the resources right now to do all of these topics. I wish they did because I, right. I think we're going to see some positive, positive steps. That's good. Um, we actually got an interesting follow-up question on some of the flight training. So let, let's get back to that. Uh, that's why we we're here live, right? <laughs> so we'll, we'll circle back to flight training a little bit. Uh, there's a question, and now I, I have no backing for these numbers. They came straight from the question, and that's, you know, how can we need flight schools after this, or that many flight schools, if uh, airlines will downsize up to 70% you and know, lots and lots of pilots being furloughed? Uh, from uh, kind of my assessment, it would be, uh, th th those types of downsizing in operations are temporary, not long term. And in the long run, uh, we'll still need, and between retirements and the fact that capacity is going to have to return, you know, travel doesn't stop. Unfortunately, it has stopped temporarily. But uh, what, what's your thought on that? Um, uh, how prolonged and how extensive you think the cutback in commercial travel is going to be? Well, it's a really interesting question. Obviously, some smart people are working on that, modeling okay. it every day. Uh, what it means to get people back to work and and uh, traveling. You know, I do think that there's going to be a, a lag on the uh, tourist uh, leisure travel for a while. Um, certainly because those are choices that you make about where that's going to go in international travel, you know, on top of that. So I think some of those are going to be more suspect for how long it takes to get back on, on to some kind of new normal. However, I, you know, haven't been a business uh, for long years and, and made a lot of business decisions uh, traveling to your customer, traveling to your factory, traveling to your family in this country is still going to be very important. I, I just don't think it's going to go to zero or down that far. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's going to take some time to come back. But I also strongly suggest that, you know, other types of aviation to get people moved around because they may not want to be in the airport with, you know, thousands of people for a while. The alternatives are, are general aviation, business aviation, and I, right. uh, it could really take a nice pickup uh, for our, our view. And remember, we access 5,000 airports. The airlines access about 400. Right. That's, I mean, GA is the way to go. You just poke holes in the sky or getting to places. And it's, 
uh, as I always say, it's not the cheapest thing in the world, but it's worth every penny. <laughs> uh, although we want to make sure that we reduce the cost as much as we can. And just also think about the bigger numbers. I mean, there's about 25,000 private pilots licenses issued every year right now. We're hopeful that we were trying to get something closer to 40 or 45,000 if you're going to go anywhere near what the airline projections were. So looking back, you know, we're still only doing 25,000 pilots a year, of which a significant percentage of them were being trained for just GA uh, alone, not just for the airline. So right. there's a lot of flight training going on for GA. Now, let me help me make one more based on the question that I have heard for you. Um, a 16-year-old uh, um, young gentleman or uh, young lady, it actually doesn't tell me. Uh, so the question was, what do you think is the best route for them to go? Should they start working on their pilot's license or join the Air Force and knock it out and uh, get, get their flight training there? Uh, now, focus group one, and one that uh, regrets not starting sooner, I say, if you're thinking about it, do it now. Uh, but I'm sure there's more context to why they should. What do you, what do you think? Well, you know, we've got a pretty good um, example in our, comp in our organization with Richard McSpadden, who flew for the Thunderbirds um, in, in a long career with the Air Force. He had his pilot's license uh, early on as a GA guy. And I think you have, an, you have an opportunity to have a step ahead. You may have to repeat a lot of this stuff as you move into the military, but I would always recommend uh, you're expanding your mind, getting some experience in flying now. If it's something you can, can find a way to do, uh, then join the military and, and have opportunities uh, there. And as we know right now, the Air Force is over 1,000 pilots short as we speak today. Right. Navy short hundreds and hundreds of pilots. All the branches are short pilots. There's a huge opportunity today to get into the services. And I mean, if, if this young pilot has the ability to start training today, hey, you know, anything as amazing as aviation, if you can dip your toe in early, um, even if, they, uh, even if uh, the ERC doesn't finish, I say, let's just go for it. That's uh, right. Go for it. That's, that's the philosophy, right? Well, clearly they'll have to, unfortunately, in most, most places, wait a few, few weeks or a month or two. But hey, the sooner you can, do it. <laughs> I, I wish I got into it sooner, too. <laughs> um, so uh, let's, uh, we're actually are getting some more technical questions around airports. So let's, let's get back to uh, that, because clearly... Um, the, the, the topic on this is pretty obvious. So another question around the impact here, uh, and this one in a weird way positive, or at least uh, implying a hopefully a positive impact, and that's what's going to happen with price of low lead, considering <laughs> I was going to get paid yesterday if I took oil. At least that's what I heard. That's what I read somewhere. <laughs> well, I've been really amazed and, and you know, looking at uh, the different systems that you can look at and reflect on fuel prices around the country. And uh, the municipal airports, the mom and pop FBOs are doing a great job of trying to pass those savings on to you as an aviator. I mean, unbelievable prices I haven't seen in 20 years are now available to you that want to go get fuel and fuel up your airplane and support those great FBOs and want to get those businesses to stay healthy as well. Now, some of the other, you know, some of the you know, bigger um, monopoly FBOs have taken not a view about passing those costs on, and I'm sorry that that's the case in a few. Uh, locations like that, but for the most part, you know, ab gas and even you know self-serve jet fuel is at unbelievable prices. And I don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, I'm thinking about buying a storage tank myself. But it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's a big darn savings uh, today for aviation. And I do think that's going to, from everything you read, even $30 barrel oil for the futures for October is a positive for our cost. On the other hand, I mean, there's always another hand. You know, some of the Texas people in the North Dakota and other places where they're pumping fuel, it'll be a hardship for some of those folks up there. And, and I think it'll pass and it'll return to some kind of normalcy. But uh, we're going to have a, a little bit of a windfall this summer for flying around. Yeah, absolutely. And, and <laughs> um, it's, it's a double-edged sword in the end, right? Because if it's too cheap, there's clearly down-the-line impact on, That's like right. you said, everything from FBOs to airports um, and everything in between. So uh, here is a, a question about AOPA uh, fun stuff, hopefully, and that's our fly-ins. We unfortunately had to uh, postpone or cancel uh, the ones coming up in the very near term. Uh, Rochester is a little further out. Uh, can you give people an update on uh, what's the status of Rochester fly-in and kind of the new normal in events like our fly-ins? 
Yeah, no, it's uh, very unfortunate that we had to give up on both San Marcos uh, this year and Casper uh, in the spring uh, because we've really enjoyed our fly-ins. It's been a positive for us and a, a member benefit, and uh, the local community really enjoys it. So I apologize that we weren't able to pull those off, but it was the right thing to do to cancel those. We've kept uh, Rochester on our uh, schedule for September, uh, Rochester, New York, and I'm hopeful that we'll have better clarity in the next month. Uh, before we have to make that hard call about you know infrastructure costs and contracts and things like that because we'd really like to be there we'd like to be there uh, making new friends in, in that part of the world and celebrating general aviation but uh, we'll, we'll update in the next uh, month month and a half to get a little bit closer to the, the transparency and the requirements state by state uh, it does seem to me that it's it's in the in the realm of very possible for us to have our rochester flying so we'll just have to see uh, you know, the big air shows that everybody looks forward to, and I do too very much uh, this year, is, is Oshkosh and AirVenture. And, right. um, you know, they're, they're working hard to try and keep that thing on track. But I, I think, you know, in the next couple of three weeks, they're going to have to make that decision. And we wish uh, the EAers um, all the best and we'd, we'd love to support them. We plan to be there, uh, but we'll have to see how that all goes. And they'll make that final decision over the next couple of three weeks. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's one of the, if you ask me, and I, I hear it uh, kind of hearing back from a lot of our pilots all over the country, the fly-ins and just events in general around aviation, and I'm partial to the fly-ins, of course. Uh, even before I started with you, I, I went to the first one a few weeks before, and I was just, I, I was sold. I was a pilot barely into it, right? And it's, uh, there's something about the real being there. We, right now, we're trying to connect to pilots doing things like this doing the pilot launch videos, doing lots and lots of stuff to try to make sure that pilots know we have their back and we're here uh, and we all should at least talk flying if we can't go flying just yet. Uh, but uh, the, the real events are, are, are a thing. And I, I personally feel like once we actually can gather again, uh, we will see a just a wave of, doesn't matter if it's three airplanes getting together for a cookout to these large events being just packed because we're all, Jumping at the bit to go out there. Yeah, right? no, I think the sight, the sight, smell, sound of, uh, of aviation events can't be replaced with a, a YouTube. It just can't. And the, the camaraderie that's real and genuine and, and seeing that new places is something I've, I've always enjoyed about aviation. We'll, I'm looking forward to it very much uh, to get back out there and do it. And I, I suspect we'll be able to do that um, sometime this summer, if not by fall. But it's a... Uh, okay. It's unfortunate. Uh, we're doing the right thing in aviation, making sure we're not a cause of a problem. Uh, but, you know, we want to get out there. And I know most no of kidding. our aviators <laughs> want to meet. Absolutely. And you know, we, uh, we have this thing in aviation called flying clubs. Um, yeah. They're kind of a, my, they're a world of their own, right? They're, their core function or the main reason they exist is for pilots to hang out, share stories, talk about flying, go flying learn from each other. And a lot of those things they can't do right now. One of the questions that uh, popped in, I think, from social media or from one of the feeds uh, earlier today or yesterday was, you know, what, what advice or what can we tell um, these guys and gals just looking to try to stay connected, stay connected to the airport, stay connected to the club when they can't even physically just go to the airport in a lot of cases? Uh, what, what advice can we give them to stay hooked up? Well, I think going to our, our site, by the way, and, and learning as much as you can about safety. And uh, Richard pointed out to me today that the visits to our site relative to safety and learning things and challenging some other your members in the, in the club to find out what the most interesting podcast or, or accent story was and sharing that among each other. You know, we were up a couple hundred percent in visits to our site uh, over the last month. It's really high quality stuff. I'm very proud of what that uh, ASI team puts together. Uh, and I, you could spend days and weeks uh, digging through that great information and make yourself a better and more informed pilot. So I'd start with that and then start challenging one another about the specifics about your model or models of aircraft and, and what they do and how they do it. Um, I think it'd be a fun thing to do, but you're right. You know, the social part about a flying club is being out to the airport, washing the airplane and knowing you're sharing a cost that's uh, reasonable and you're having fun. And that part of it's a little interrupted today, but you can still get smarter about flying. And uh, uh, we're uh, no different than a lot of the other industries that are kind of suffering from the same thing. And uh, I've noticed, and as um, hollow as it seems or incomplete, uh, seems like you know, getting together on Skype, getting together on Zoom, 
uh, you know, bunch of people just chatting about flying or you know, trading stories. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, it's not the thing. It's not the real thing. But hopefully it can get us uh, uh, some satisfaction until we can go and get together and start flying again. That's right. Uh, I mean, it's still a good idea to share it. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, more technical questions coming in. So, so let's jump to uh, legacy aircraft and uh, experimental avionics. Uh, there's a question, and is there is uh, what's the status on FAA getting us some ability to put in uh, experimental um, uh, or non-TSO avionics uh, in um, um, legacy aircraft and vintage airplanes? So, you know, uh, we've made a lot of progress over the years, and uh, uh, six or seven years ago, it was, it was almost unconscionable that we would have non-TSO avionics and prices coming down as it started out with an issue around ADSB and moved on into all types of avionics as well as autopilots. The world continues to move in ways that are very positive for putting non-TSO products into vintage, you know, certified aircraft. I do think there continues to be more movement, more innovation that's coming to the market, and because of competition. It just didn't exist a half a dozen years ago. So I'm really proud of what the industry's done. I'm really proud of what our, uh, you know, I talked to avionics shops all around the country, and they are backed up, which is a good thing, even beyond the ESB deadline that was uh, effective, you know, four or five months ago. So I think there's new stuff coming out every day. Um, some of the stuff that, you know, you want to get to pure experimental, we're probably not quite ready for that. Again, back to this mosaic rule that was continuing to evolve, might have had some opportunities in that direction, but for now, where I would say, if you can buy an autopilot for three, four, five thousand uh, dollars for a basic autopilot, or you know, a, a new electronic uh, HSI system for twenty-five hundred dollars, boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's a great value and a great safety enhancement for your aircraft. You got to think about it. Yeah. So, cost uh, is, I think, an interesting uh, avenue to take this conversation quick. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the places where uh, pilots are running into uh, uh, let's call it a, uh, an un, uh, unexpected expense, uh, is when they budget for the aircraft and a budget to upgrade the hardware and that kind of thing. Last, uh, in pretty recent time, they get hit with a really, really surprise uh, increase in insurance rates. Uh, insurance has been uh, kicking butt a lot of, of a lot of pilots, uh, even once flying the same exact aircraft, aircraft let alone if they're upgrading. Uh, are moving uh, you know, up in weight uh, or uh, um, going going into turbines and things like that. Uh, it's clearly a, a, an issue uh, and one that, um, as far as I've been able to see, has kept some pilots out of aircraft or out of flying even. Uh, what, what can we do? What's, what's going to happen? Because it, it does seem like it's a bit of a shock to a lot of the industry how quickly the rates have gone up. Yeah, I, I, and it's been a real big challenge. Uh, Tom Hain and I and Richard McSpad have been working on this for a better part of nine months, uh, working to communicate with the insurance underwriters to you know, understand the safety. One, and Tom's got some pretty good articles that you can find on our website about how we view, you know, you know, maybe it's not time to go shopping for saving $100 or $200. Maybe it's time to make sure you've got a, a safety protocol that you're shipping to your agent to tell them you know, what you're doing to you, your own safety and then recurrency training and all the things that you're doing to make sure you're, you're being as safe as you can and, and having the right kind of airplane and flying it the right way. Uh, it's a really important time. I mean, I wish there was a leverage to the market, but unfortunately between some of the commercial issues going on in the insurance industry and the quick big number is, you know, the insurance underwriting premium for all of aviation in the U.S. is around a billion five. And there's been way more than that spent on business interruption for the Boeing 737s and other issues related. We've had some big commercial and, and you know, jets lost and, and costs have gone up like crazy this last couple of years. So I'm not making excuses for the insurance industry, but they would tell you if you know they, they like business and if they could underwrite business and make money, they'd be doing it. They have lost money and, and they're trying to get some recovery of that. I think in my view, and I've been telling them, they're trying to do it way too fast. But um, we're working with every condition we can to try and find a way to keep that insurance available. It's not as cheap as it once was, but it's, uh, it is interesting if you look back 10 or 15 years ago, we had through this same kind of tightness in the market, and it took a while for it to kind of get rationalized. So it may be a couple of years. So you think it'll be a couple of years before things kind of stabilize and normalize on, on that front? 
Uh, you know, it's, yep. uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, on the other hand, uh, interest rates, right, have uh, even more so now been at historical lows from buying the airplane. It's insuring the airplane. That's unfortunately been a, uh, a, a bit of a surprise to some, I think, uh, right? Yeah, no, I think that's right. Interest rates on aircraft, uh, if you're using uh, borrowed money to do it, is probably a great buy today. Like I said a bit earlier, you know, upgrading avionics is so much better avionics today, a better price than it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, so there's some opportunities here that we've seen that are good. And, and up until recently, we don't know what's happened in the last month, actually. But, you know, used prices on aircraft, Bonanza's, so 182s to Moonies have all gone positive, in a positive direction. So it's been a good investment. And I happen to think it's still a big investment. It, and I, I think it'll continue to be. Again, we are thoroughly in, in a extreme, but a hopefully a, a short-term impact event. Uh, now, let's, let's, keep, let's keep digging down this uh, uh, price and cost hole a little bit more, because uh, that's, I think, on everybody's mind at all times when it comes to aviation. Uh, it's never going to be cheap. It's never cheap, but we can do things to make it less okay. costly Good. for pilots. So, so let, let's, uh, let's talk about um, when I land and taxi over to an FBO. Uh, we have yeah, gotten think- a lot of questions around uh, uh, concerns with uh, uh, costs of uh, parking, fuel, yeah, things like that. Uh, what, what's the FBA doing? Oh. Go ahead, Mark. I think you uh, okay. froze for a second there. Okay. Yeah. No. The uh, you know the team has been working really hard at getting this charting done, so that we don't have the uh, requirement to go to an FBO ramp that we don't need services for, and stay out of their way, and either have a uh, low cost alternative for not using their services. And the the industry is moving in the right direction. And the FAA is moving in the right direction to get that charting done, so we know where that place is because it's hard to know today where where you can park <laughs> uh, with those lower costs potentially, and stay out of the way of the FBO that's trying to run a business. Um, but it's moving down that path and we're going to see that happen and also we're continuing to encourage where it makes sense to have um, competitive uh, FBO on some of these bigger airports that can afford it uh, but we really care deep, deeply right now about having the mom and pop FBO that's done a great job supporting general aviation uh, municipal guys do do well and we want to get back out there and start flying and buying gas from and get airplane serviced and annual and all that stuff so we want to protect uh, our ecosystem around that while looking at the costs that we can help manage. It doesn't make sense to me that you have places that are, you know, $7 for fuel and places you have $3 for fuel right. and buying it from the same place for the most part. Oh, that's So uh, an interesting follow-up questions on all the things that AOPA is doing. Uh, and I appreciate the support of whoever posted that question uh, around uh, uh, AOPA Foundation and the legacy uh, that um, a lot of, pilots are helping us build here. Now, now, clearly, AOPA has a huge amount of legs here from working with the FAA to uh, helping pilots with legal issues, medical issues, uh, putting out a, I think it's not too, uh, I'm not understating when I say it's an it's a absolutely epically leading magazine in this industry, uh, incredible websites, tools and online, lots and lots of, lots of things AOPA does. Um, and it's supported by uh, everything from uh, pilots simply being AOPA pilots to uh, the legacy program. But the question here is, what what is the legacy program? Why why should I care? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, the AOPA Foundation uh, has primarily led its support to the safety side of uh, aviation, our outreach side, and then more recently, the um, You Can Fly program, which has the high school program in it, which we now have. Um, I think almost 300 high schools applied to have the, the training and, and lesson plans for this fall, um, all provided by donors. And some of our donors are within the year, the week, and the month, and some are working to the match to the, to the Ray Foundation, which has got a, an opportunity to be matched to $2.5 million this year to help all those programs go on, including our flight training and our, our flight flying club, and Rusty Pilots. All those programs are, are done by the foundation. And the legacy is an opportunity for after we're done with our wings on this earth, uh, to employ our energy to make sure that the next generations to come have the same kind of uh, access to general aviation as we have today. And we've had so many generous people include us in their will and, and uh, at AOPA, and, and uh, whether it's a piece of their 401k or something, 
That's all it takes, and we just ask you to think about uh, your, your state planning through for AOPA. It's no different than giving it to your college or any place else uh, that you care about. Uh, we want to have a, a future generation that has this opportunity to enjoy general aviation in a, in a very significant way. So thanks for those that have contributed. Thanks for those who listed us. Um, we are still raising money every day to get this thing called general aviation more accessible to more people. And you know, just uh, I'm on the legacy wall for that same reason, right? I'm clearly a vested interest, but also the fact that we're, we're impacting something for many years, probably after I'm, like you said, long on the other side of the mountain there. Uh, now, from that perspective, uh, AOPA also does some things for the, with the government. And we had another interesting question here with this being an election year and a lot of things that AOPA does when it comes to being in contact with and working with and trying to make sure that the politicians on the Hill have our back. Um, the question is, uh, can pilots uh, expect some kind of an endorsement list, who to support, um, you know, who defends? Again, uh, can they get uh, or will they get any kind of information for who has our back when it comes to this coming election? Sure. You know, uh, we have a GA caucus list and uh, we get to be part of the GA caucus and, and we support those that support uh, general aviation with our PAC, our political action committee. And, you know, we have been very diligent about making sure that those representatives uh, stand for general aviation. One of the reasons that we have this $100 million part of the earmark uh, for uh, infrastructure investment in just GA airports, not the big airports, $100 million dollars. Is being sent to airports right now as we speak uh, in the across this country. Over 3,000 airports are going to get something uh, to help them, you know, take care of their airport running. It's, and it's because we have a general aviation caucus, and that support is meaningful. And and we can share uh, the members of the of the GA caucus is a publicly known uh, group, and those are the ones that you should be supporting uh, come this fall. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, we got a question for me, <laughs> so I'll answer it. Uh, the question was, what is the motorcycle behind me uh, in my basement? And that is, uh, it is not a BSA Bantam, which was the question, which was the uh, guess. Uh, it's a 1947 Yava Perak uh, that my grandfather used to uh, ride. And I restored it and brought it from Czech Republic, where I'm from. And now it's in my basement because uh, I am slightly oversized and I look like a trained bear if I ride it. <laughs> so th th thank you thank you for uh, the uh, com comedic break question for uh, for somebody uh, clearly the only part of my basement that's decorated uh, so uh, an, an interesting other question uh, came up on uh, our flight planner uh, and what's been happening with that now uh, this is not actually on purpose the timing but a lot of my team Tom Haynes's team uh, our technology crew a lot of them have been working on the migration into the new flight planner, which was actually announced and switched over this morning. Again, not intentional, but the timing works out. Um, can you uh, tell everybody a little bit more about the switchover? Uh, we clearly still have a desktop flight planner. I think I'm, I am personally excited about the, uh, the new one that we have uh, for the pilots that still want to use desktop. Uh, tell us more about it. Well, I mean, you do, do tell more about it because you're going to help to design it. Uh, well, but, you know, it's, it's, it's important. To have, <laughs> your title is on the video. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to have a tool for people to use at home to do their flight planning and keeping track of their flights and, and where they're planning to go and what's what's available there. And you know, they kind of call it the new electronic airport directory uh, about all the things you're going to find and opportunities you have there and what kind of services are there. But, you know, to have that at your fingertips something that our members have used thousands and thousands of times every month. And, uh, you know, we appreciate uh, Jefferson and, and Boeing in the past have been very supportive uh, of that. And where we're going in the future, Yurka, uh, you guys have done, pulled it off. So thanks for getting it done. It's a, uh, it's a resource that, uh, let's be honest, uh, that's why we're here, right, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I was surprised how many pilots use the desktop flight planner. But you know what? It's our job to provide it if pilots need it. And the, we made the switch over. I think we have a great product. Uh, in the end, you know, if, if a pilot wants to use the highest end of VFBs, they should and use it uh, as much as they want to. The desktop flight planner is a great resource for on the ground plans, and it's out there. Uh, I definitely weighed lifted. I'm glad that the switch over went well this morning. And thanks for your support on that one. Um, Good. So let's uh, move on to a, a kind of a fun question about uh, the alternatives to a $100 hamburger. 
uh, since a lot of pilots can't get it right now. Now, those uh, connected <laughs> question, are you still flying? Which I know you are with the cup that's right behind you, which is allowed, right? You're still flying. Yeah, no, I've got my 1953 Super Cub here in the hangar. And uh, I've had this airplane for over 25 years and um, put thousands of hours in this airplane. And uh, I take it out and I go, f go for a ride, stay current, what I'm trying to do. Of course, I only have a couple thousand hours in that particular airplane. Uh, so I have to stay current in it. Uh, but it has been a great uh, release for me to go out for a ride in the morning and, and uh, see this beautiful earth and sky and ocean here in Florida. And I, I believe uh, doing everything compliant uh, is important to do that. And going by and fuel at the local uh, FBO is important and trying to talk to the folks. So, uh, yes, I am. And I, I firmly believe that that's a, an opportunity. And it's, um, it's a privilege, by the way. You know, it, and well, some people like to think of it as right. We work hard to keep that privilege uh, front and center with all the local uh, and, and federal government. Right on. And uh, uh, the first part of that question around the $100 hamburger. Uh, so besides the obvious, pack a sandwich. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what would be a good alternative uh, since you, if you can still go fly, uh, you just can go fly and like a sandwich, joking aside. Uh, for those that can't, uh, you know, we talked about a couple of different things. Uh, some of our team work on things like the destination section on AOPA.org. Uh, we have lots of great uh, videos and content. In the end, it's chair flying or hangar flying, whatever you want to call it. Uh, for some, I think it's going to unfortunately be the only way that they can stay connected to flying for the next few weeks, a month. Uh, any other ideas on how to get, uh, what's the alternative to a $100 hamburger? Well, you know, like I said, uh, peanut butter and jelly still works and it's cheaper. But uh, <laughs> I think, you know, you can, uh, you know, I, I really believe you got to stay connected. And I've uh, been taking the opportunity to do FaceTiming with some of my uh, aviation buddies uh, and having one on one chats across the country. Uh, to do that and talk about the you know, called the good old days of last year and our plans for later this summer and, and hopefully fall uh, to get back out and fly around. So take the opportunity to call your buddies that you haven't seen in a long time, find out what, what they're thinking about, where they're going to go. And it's a lot of fun. That's great. Now, uh, <laughs> questions to steer us nicely back to serious stuff again. And that's since you're out, you know, going out there flying, you're burning out some parts. And a pretty solid question here, which I think uh, everybody's run into. Uh, aircraft parts are not cheap. Uh, expensive is the way the question labels it, which is probably accurate. Uh, and a lot of times take a long time to get. What can we do about that? So, you know, what I've been seeing in some of the uh, higher volume parts and this PMA authority, Parts Manufacturing Authority. And if you think about it, it's... Uh, it's a little bit of what um, um, Continental did to copy the Lycoming engine with the Titan and offer it for lower prices, which you see in both certified and non-certified aircraft. You're starting to see this PMA, Parts Manufacturing Authority, being applied in a lot of other areas. Everything from turbine wheels and jets to brakes and other pieces in the aircraft world. And I think as more and more of that Parts Manufacturing Authority comes online, uh, it has a potential to offer parts to flying public at lower prices and, and compete with the OEMs that have had more or less a lock on that on those prices and, and in some cases uh, not all we like parts availability uh, is really important first because it doesn't matter what the part is if you don't have it uh, what the price is but I think uh, between the PMA and bringing in more competition to this is a real opportunity and there's everything from three-day printing and going back to again to the mosaic rule what alternative uh, means of compliance could be uh, all of those things are moving in the right direction, but I do know what you're talking about. Um, certain parts and certain products are brutal, and I, I, I get it. And I'm, we're here for you. We're working on it, and we're trying to get the word out to uh, uh, manufacturers that some of these things, we really, we're struggling to uh, keep the fleet alive, and we want to keep this fleet alive. And, and on that note, a lot of our uh, pilot crew out there, and it's a still a good number, flies LSAs. Uh, they're even having a hard time getting a mechanic that's qualified to work on them. Uh, is there anything we can do about that? Uh, I know that there's, you know, there's suggestions of uh, pilots being able to work on it themselves, other things. What can we do? Yeah, no, there's, there's lots of learnings we can do around the world. You know, and in some parts of the world, you're able to do your compliance uh, for non-commercial aircraft yourself, much like you can with a home-built aircraft if you're the manufacturer. 
Um, and we want to understand what the safety implications are and, and trying to figure out if it works there, why can't it work here? Again, all part of that you know, next phase, of what's the right thing to do for these aircraft and what is the right size, weight, structures that are really uh, driven to protect the safety, but you know, create both the economics and in fact, the realities. You know, we do believe there's an opportunity for more mechanics in this world, uh, which is part of our high school program as well. Uh, remind them there's there, you can make a good living being a mechanic today in, in an aircraft. That's great. And speaking of uh, making a good living in aviation, uh, APA scholarships. We give away, uh, and we're fortunate enough to have the ability to give away some incredible number of scholarships from students to actually teachers as well. For a, and I would love your input on that because that's that's a pretty critical thing to do, especially for our high school program. Uh, now. The date is May 15th. That's when applications are due. So we're still going to give them away. They're still going to be awarded this year. Uh, life goes on, and we will kick this virus thing eventually, and we will be training students again. So we're going to be awarding those scholarships. But uh, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, how we decide uh, on the scholarships, and especially um, the ones that are going to the, the, the teachers that teach the curriculum. Because I, I, I personally think that that's a, one incredible thing we're doing. And two, it's epically critical to the high school program for the teachers to have as much access to aviation as possible. Yeah, the, uh, the James Ray Foundation, which uh, got to know James Ray personally before he passed a couple of years ago, April 1st, um, was very interested in getting uh, people to touch aviation and change in their lives, not necessarily moving down to an airline career. And he was one of the early supporters of this thing. And the, his foundation, as a matter of fact, is what the money we administer, a uh, million dollars of scholarships that we put out there every year now. Uh, and we look to the inputs from the, uh, the applicant, from quality of the writing, the supporters and sponsors that they've got, the connectivity they've got, what kind of classes they've done in the past. It's a very difficult selection. We have thousands and thousands of applicants um, and, you know, we do hold off, you know, at least 20 of them, uh, those applications for the teachers, because that's a multiplier effect. And we've had great response for their ability to now touch and fly and then touch 30, 40 students a semester about what flying is really like. So it's a great program. It's one I'm very proud of. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's amazing the interest that we have in it. Um, so if you're one of the lucky ones to, get, to uh, win the, uh, the scholarship, uh, we see you know, great accomplishments of those people getting their licenses and getting their ratings uh, within the next, uh, you know, 12 months. So it's uh, been a very gratifying program, uh, but it is competitive, I'll tell you that. It is, and uh, it's, uh, I was fortunate to read some of the applications, and a uh, you know, million dollars seems, seems like a lot, but I, I wish we were able to go away more. It's, uh, there's some incredible people out there, well-deserving of getting a left seat in the airplane. Hopefully, every one of them finds a way to do it even the ones that, uh, for good or bad, are, cannot be selected to win these. So, um, there's always a another, way. Exactly, there's always a way. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people have been pumping gas for hours, uh, for decades before I started flying, and they made it work, right? <laughs> uh, so, another question around uh, dates was around our RV-10 sweepstakes, which we did a couple of videos with Dave Hirschman, Dave did a couple. Uh, the airplane is just epic. You've seen it. It, it's absolutely beautiful inside and out uh, the way it transformed and i've seen a couple of these airplanes come through and uh granted that super cup on floats from last year still my favorite but that rv10 really close second and yes i'll answer that question for you mark if you don't mind we are still giving away that airplane sweepstakes close on november 16th uh, that airplane is going to be flying with one of our pilots out there no matter what so you know, one AOPA pilot is going to get that airplane, and I am really not happy it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be you. It can't be me. But somebody is really going to enjoy, really enjoy uh, owning that airplane. And it is a piece of, of art, genuinely is, and, and such a capable airplane uh, to go somewhere. So I'm, I'm sure that uh, I and the team will be uh, delivering it to somebody's uh, uh, ramp uh, this fall, late this fall. And whoever wins this one um, is a really lucky person. Right. <laughs> now, that airplane, uh, and I, I got a segue for you, uh, as long shot as it is, is a giant collection of incredible tech. Um, it's, you know, 
th three giant primary screens, lots of backup instruments, battery backups. Uh, I think I joked about it with Dave's uh, on uh, on the video with Dave. Unless you get hit with the EMP, you are going to have instruments in some shape or form. <laughs> uh, uh, no, it's it's but, uh, very capable. Right. Uh, but it, uh, that airplane, just like almost every other one out there these days, uses GPS. So to some, this might be an eclectic question, uh, but it is a pretty critical one that came up in the feed, and I think it's a good one for us to address. Uh, Legato Networks uh, and the concern about the disruption of the GPS signal with some of the 5G uh, and some of the things their uh, FCC is approving with their plans. Uh, what's happening with that? Tell us about it. So most recently, the uh, five commissioners of the FCC, bipartisan group, by the way, um, did agree to the Legato petition, which goes back to the original light squared, although they did put more filters and more ranging uh, on their spectrum that they wanted to apply for this time. It's less, than, uh, less likely to interfere with the GPS signal, they say. We just don't know enough right now, and uh, Tom Hain and I have been calling the avionics manufacturers and getting their views, which are the experts in our area. You know, one of the things we, you know, if it's a, important to the American public and it brings low cost down or better bandwidth for lots of other reasons, obviously a positive, but it cannot, cannot uh, be at the risk or safety of flight. Uh, and the Department of Defense, and today Jim Inhofe and his team uh, and a few other senators came up pretty firmly against going too fast here. Uh, we really need to understand what the spectrum uh, means to uh, aviation in both uh, defense uh, aviation as well as general aviation and commercial aviation. So we've got a lot to learn, um, and there are um, alternatives to how we can manage this process uh, through legislative issues, uh, which we're particularly strong on with the whole aviation group. So we're going to learn more, and then we're going to do the right thing. Uh, I, there's nothing to be worried about uh, this year or next year on this petition. Uh, they can't move that fast. But we will uh, we'll be digging into it and getting the industry support. So a lot of solutions to issues like this is technology. Uh, one of my passions, right? Tech solves all. At least we believe it always does, which it, uh, maybe it's a pipe dream. Uh, but for that to happen in aviation, we have continued to have issues uh, with new technology and even uh, newish technology like electronic ignition, let alone GPS uh, or you know, GPS signal strike funding equipment, uh, getting approved, getting certified, uh, which it to normal pilots that are out there talking to us right now in, in the feed or in the messages, it seems crazy, right? Some of these things seem like they would only improve safety. Electronic ignition is a perfect example of that. Um, can we push a little bit? Can we get a little bit of a faster <laughs> approval on some of these things? What can we do? Yeah, so first off, we need the manufacturers to you know, uh, provide the technology to do that. You know, my 1953 Super Cup behind us here does have electronic ignition on one side. Frankly, it should have it on both sides, to tell you the truth. But the, uh, the rule today, is it only allows it to have one side. Um, we know it starts better, runs cooler. It does all the right things. Um, and part of this, again, other rule mosaic in terms of opening up some of this portal to having better technologies go faster with lower cost of certification uh, is something that's really important to us. Again, I think we made some you know, real positive moves on some of the things that have moved pretty quickly. Uh, but there are other parts that are just frustratingly slow. Uh, dual electronic ignition should not be um, should not be considered, in my mind, uh, something that is experimental. You know, the you know, number of the amateur built home built aircraft have had it for years and years and years and performed extremely well. Um, and, uh, there are other technologies like that that are lower cost and come to the market. We'd like to see the uh, the OEMs and the manufacturers drive that initiative because we're not the we don't have the technology and the science behind us but we we want to support them oh that's that's perfectly fair and you know, we're, we're um i'm proud of the team at aopa for accomplishing a ton some of these things just take time and take us supporting the industry not just us driving on our own and it, it happens that way uh, i think basic med is a great example right that was a multi-year hard-headed effort and we got it done that said uh, there's still more to be done um uh, some countries are not accepting basic med, right? Um, there's uh, questions around U.S. flyers being able to you know, fly in Canada. Now, ADSP plays into that, right? Because ADSP rules are different. 
So uh, let's talk about uh, flying to our close neighbors. <laughs> uh, and okay. What are we working? What are we working on in uh, flying to our uh, neighbors to the north? Or to the, the south? Basic to is the is <laughs> Basic Med is a, is a terrific uh, win to the general aviation public and we worked with all, a lot of industry groups, but uh, Jim Kuhn and the team downtown did a great job of getting that thing across the finish line. It'll be three years ago next uh, next week, I think, that was actually effective. Um, and uh, the safety has not been an issue. It's been over 55,000 folks are actually using Basic Med today. Can, you can go back and forth to the Bahamas today with it. You can go back and forth to Mexico uh, today with uh, the Basic Med. It, we had an ICAO. International Civil Aviation Organization meeting planned for um, uh, June in uh, Montreal, and we're still expecting to have some type of virtual meeting on that. That was going to be um, petitioned to have the basic med be recognized around the world as part of a standard. Uh, I'm still hopeful that it can be done both either through that uh, mechanism or directly through a mechanism with Canada to recognize it in a kind of a bilateral uh, agreement. They have a couple of different things that they'd like to have recognized in the U.S. So. We're working a couple of different avenues to get that done, and uh, I believe we will get it done. I don't think it'll be in the summer of 2020 that it'll be recognized, but I do believe it will, we will get that done. Uh, and the Canadians are working with us to get the, a way to, to make that happen. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, this has uh, caused us not to have the meetings in person, which I think are when you're trying to convince and sell and, and uh, right. deliberate, it's a lot better in person. And so that's one of the things we're missing right now is not, not the ability to go to Canada to have that meeting, but we're going to get it done. Trust me, we're going to someday. That's right. And speaking of two things connected, getting it done in Canada, ATC privatization is something that we were able to resist thanks to support of every single one of our pilots out there. And it is never coming back, right? <laughs> it's not until the next <laughs> time. Uh, you know, think about this world today, you know, uh, had we been privatized, and uh, I think this is a real lesson to take away. You know, the airlines are in very difficult financial shape, um, and, you know, they are um, getting, you know, support and, and creating loans and warrants and all those kind of things for their financial structure. But what happened to the ATC structure? You know, we've already seen the ATC suffer what they call ATC zero, where in New York Center and a number of the centers have had to close down and basically you go to a Unicom. Um, thank God we have uh, the ATC led by the FAA because it becomes a public benefit, not a private benefit. It would be handled completely different, in my view. We'd have a very different access to some, uh, general aviation, business aviation today had it been uh, privatized. So and I think this is a uh, note worth making for the future fights. Absolutely. So that's, uh, I guess it's not never coming back again, but that's probably a more fair, more fair and realistic uh, <laughs> answer. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, I've held you up uh, for a little over an hour. Uh, is there other things that you would want to cover, things that you want to tell pilots out there, especially those like me that are locked in their basements and don't want to be here? <laughs> <laughs> There's two show paths, but I do that's believe right. that... Uh, uh, you know, the economy has is, is, is got some real challenges, and I feel badly for a number of people that have been either affected by their health and their, uh, certainly their economics, and, and there's going to be some challenging times for lots of people. And so we at AOP care first about those circumstances, uh, and then we really want to do a, a good job of supporting the economy, uh, getting the businesses back going, getting you know, recreation travel, which is a very important part of how people make money in this country and tourism and all that. And general aviation can be a very big part of the fight back toward a healthy economy and a healthy world. So thanks for your support for AOPA and what you, uh, what you care about in aviating. We care about and represent you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.